What is up, Iwu crew? Today, we're going to take a look at a lesser-known figure from the Old West. But though his name may not be as famous today, his reputation was notorious during his lifetime. Let's explore the life of James Miller, the killer, a fearsome assassin for hire. James Jim Brown Miller was born in 1861 in Van Buren, Arkansas, though some sources say that he wasn't born until 1865. He was raised in Texas after his family moved to Franklin when he was only one. Jim's father, Jacob Miller, worked as a stonemason who helped to build the very first Capitol building in Austin, Texas. However, Jacob would have very little influence on his son's life, possibly to his detriment, as he died a few years after the family moved. After her husband died, Jim's mother, Cynthia, took her young child to live with her parents in Evant, Texas. It was while living here with his grandparents that the hints of James's much darker side first emerged. In 1869, both of his grandparents were found murdered in their home. Though only eight years old at the time, Jim was arrested for the crime. He was eventually released and not prosecuted for the deaths of his grandparents. But something in his behavior and the evidence discovered at the scene had led investigators to suspect the young boy. Unfortunately, we do not know for certain who killed his grandparents. However, we can make assumptions based on the fact that many people at the time speculated that these deaths may have been the first of Jim's famously long list. After this, Jim went to live with his sister Georgia and her husband, John Thomas Coop, on their farm. For years, everything seemed to be going well, and a census in 1880 recorded that by the time Jim was 19, he was living with his widowed mother and other siblings. However, whether we believe that he killed his grandparents or not, violence would once again call to Jim, setting him down a path that would define the rest of his life. In 1884, Jim had an argument with his brother-in-law, John Coop, who he was said to detest. The exact circumstances of how the fight ended is debated, as some sources say that during the argument, Jim shot and killed John, while others say that long after the heat of the argument cooled, Jim sought out John and shot him later that evening while he was in his bed. Either way, this time there was no question if Jim had been the one to kill his family member, as he was arrested shortly after. After a trial, he was convicted for the murder and sentenced to life in prison. The story doesn't end here, though, as despite the fact it was well known that Jim had likely killed his brother-in-law, a technicality resulted in his conviction being overturned, and he was soon released from prison. Jim didn't return to the family farm, whether he was welcomed back or not, but soon found work as a hired hand on the McCulloch County Ranch. Here, he worked for Emmanuel Manon Clements, a violent man who was the cousin of the notorious outlaw, John Wesley Harden. During this time, Jim worked as a cowboy and raced horses. It is also believed that he may have occasionally worked as a hired killer and train robber around this period. Jim eventually married Sally Clements, Man and Clements' daughter, and together they would eventually have four kids. This period working for Manon was short-lived, however, as three years later, Manon was killed by Ballinger City Marshal Joe Townsend. Soon after, Townsend himself was attacked in an ambush by an unknown assailant. Many people at the time and later have speculated that Jim was the one to shoot Townsend in retribution for Manon's death, as Townsend was attacked with a shotgun. Using a shotgun later became known as Jim's weapon of choice and even part of his signature style. Townsend survived, though he may have had his arm amputated, and it is still unconfirmed whether or not Jim had been the one to shoot him. As he traveled around the Texas-Mexico border, Jim began to earn the nickname Deacon Jim, in stark contrast to his more unsavory endeavors. 
Despite having likely killed at least one person, he was also a devout Methodist who frequently attended church. Jim was often recognized by the particular way he dressed immaculately in a long black frock coat no matter the weather. He also refused to drink, swear, or smoke, which only added to his image of a well-mannered gentleman. But rather than a real gentleman, Jim was a wolf in sheep's clothing. At some point, Jim operated a saloon in San Saba County before becoming a deputy sheriff and then a town marshal in Pecos where he was hired by the Reeves County Sheriff George A. Bud Frazier. It was in this position as town marshal that Jim gained a savage reputation, as he was known to regularly kill anyone from Mexico that he came across, often offering the weak explanation that they had been attempting to escape. It is reported that he bragged about his kills, saying, lost my notch stick on Mexicans that I killed out on the border. Jim eventually moved his family to Pecos, where they helped to maintain his image of a decent church-going man. But not everyone was convinced by Jim's admirable image, and he came into conflict with one man in particular, Sheriff Frazier, who had originally hired him. There was a power struggle between the two men, and Frazier became displeased to learn that while he was away from Pecos, Jim had allegedly allowed criminals to gain power in the area. Given his wife's relation to known outlaws, it wouldn't be surprising if Jim himself had been consorting with the shady characters. The frequency of criminal acts such as cattle rustling and horse theft increased under Jim's watch. As well, suspicions arose that Jim could have been in cahoots with many of the criminals, as he often claimed to be in pursuit of bandits and thieves, but never actually caught any. The issue of growing crime resulted in Frazier seeking the help of the Texas Ranger, John R. Hughes, in order to clear out the criminals who had settled in the area with the encouragement of Jim. As part of their plan to clean up Pecos, Jim was fired from his job as marshal. Jim did not take his loss of power lying down and soon hatched a plan to assassinate Frazier when he returned to Pecos. A plan was concocted for a staged shootout on the railway station platform where a third man would be ready to shoot Frazier, covering up the murder to look like an accident in the shootout. Frazier caught wind of the plan and Jim was arrested by the Ranger Hughes and allegedly indicted for conspiring to kill Frazier. However, the primary prosecution witness soon died, leaving the state empty-handed on evidence. This mysterious death would not be forgotten, but still, they let Jim and his accomplices go. At a separate time, Frazier also had Jim arrested for theft, as he believed that he had stolen some mules and this was just another thorn in Jim's side that would stoke his anger during their continuing feud. In 1894, the confrontations between the two men came to a head, as Frazier was certain Jim was responsible for much of the unrest in Pecos, but struggled to get rid of him. When Frazier learned that Jim may have been involved in the murder of a cattleman named Con Gibson, Frazier believed it was his only opportunity to finally be rid of Jim. Con Gibson is believed to have been the very man who told Frazier of the plan to assassinate him. The man meant to be the primary prosecution witness against Jim in his previous murder trial. But he was killed before he could testify, allegedly at the hand of one of Jim's henchmen. When confronting Jim, Frazier didn't wait for Jim to get his shotgun to defend himself. Instead, he shot him on sight. Jim was wounded in the right arm and hurried to grab his shotgun. As he tried to awkwardly discharge his gun with his left hand, he accidentally shot a bystander. Frazier shot him again, this time hitting him in the groin. Jim fell to the ground, but Frazier wanted to be sure he was dead and so he completely emptied his six-shooter into Jim's chest for good measure. After the disastrous shootout, Jim's friends rushed to check on him, and amazingly, he wasn't dead. They took him to the doctor, thinking that it was almost hopeless and he would soon die. To everyone's shock, 
When the doctor peeled back Jim's customary frock coat, they found that he was wearing a large steel plate across his chest, like a bulletproof vest. The metal contraption ended up saving his life. Later that same year, after Jim had recovered from his wounds, Frazier again tried to kill him. As Jim was standing outside a blacksmith shop, Frazier shot him again, this time wounding him in the arm and leg and attempting to land a fatal shot in the chest. But once again, the metal plate he wore saved his life. Jim actually sought legal retribution after this attempt on his life, and though Frazier was charged, it ended in a hung jury. Jim eventually had enough of Frazier's repeated attempts to kill him, and in 1896, he took his revenge. Jim heard that Frazier was in Toya, Texas, and went out to find him. According to accounts of the event, Jim shoved open the saloon swinging doors and leveled his shotgun at the gambling table where Frazier sat. He fired with both barrels, reportedly removing most of Frazier's head with the attack. Jim was taken to court for Frazier's death, where his defense was that, quote, he had done no worse than Frazier. Earp died from a shotgun wound three weeks after the trial. That same night, Jim rode a hundred miles on horseback to give himself an alibi. Later, an attorney who prosecuted Jim, Judge Stanley, died from food poisoning. But it was speculated that he was actually murdered. Even though Jim had quite a lengthy rap sheet, it is believed that he eventually became a Texas Ranger himself, where he was said to have killed at least one person while serving in this position. Today, some argue that Jim had never been made a true ranger, but rather had pretended to be one to get away with crimes. Eventually, in 1900, Jim moved his family to Fort Worth, where his wife opened a boarding house. It was here that Jim's criminal career really took off. He began to advertise his work as a professional assassin for hire, often bragging about the murders he had already committed. Jim offered to kill anyone he was hired to for the price of $150 per death. Jim began a complicated dance with the law at this point, as though he was an outlaw. He was rarely found guilty of any crime. Early on, he was hired to kill two men which resulted in him being arrested for one of the men's murder. For some reason, Jim's partner Lawrence Angel took the fall for the murder charge, and Jim ended up testifying in court that it had been in self-defense. As an assassin, Jim made quite a bit of money when the Old West began to see the Great Sheep Wars, which were a series of feuds between sheepmen and cattlemen fighting over grazing rights. The cattlemen often viewed the sheepmen as intruders on their lands, and the conflicts turned bloody. Jim was frequently hired to kill sheepmen in the area, and allegedly killed up to a dozen men. As this was going on, another conflict was taking place over fences. The fences around people's land were often in the way of cattle herds, and so Jim was also hired to kill some of the farmers who built obtrusive fences around their property. When the lawyer, James Jarrett, became involved with the fence feuds, he took the side of the farmers against the cattlemen. Jarrett successfully represented a few farmers, earning himself the reputation as an enemy of the cattlemen. Jim was then hired to kill Jarrett for $500. Jim caught Jarrett just as his horses were drinking water near his farm and shot him four times. Jim would later remark that Jarrett was hardest damn man to kill I ever tackled. Though Jim was creating an impressively long list of victims, not all of his kills were ones he was hired to carry out. Sometimes he killed to protect his other criminal endeavors. In 1904, Jim killed a man he had entered into a real estate deal with, T.D. Frank Four. The problem was that Four was an honest businessman, and Jim had begun a scheme where he sold lots that were actually submerged in the Gulf of Mexico. Four threatened to tell a grand jury about the scheme, and so Jim shot him in the washroom of the Delaware Hotel. As witnesses rushed to see what had happened, Jim shouted, I did everything I could to keep him from reaching for his gun. And with tears reportedly in his eyes, 
claimed that he had killed four in self-defense. Some sources argue that this death was another one of his contract kills, but this isn't verified. Either way, he was acquitted for the death. Jim's death toll continued, including a job where he was paid to exact revenge on a U.S. deputy marshal named Ben Collins. Collins had shot and partially paralyzed a man named Port Pruitt several years before, and when Port heard he could hire Jim to kill his enemy, he paid him a lofty sum. Jim shot Collins in front of his home and his wife, and though he was once again arrested, he was miraculously released after a short time in jail. Jim's flourishing career of contract killing seemed to be above the law, but all of that would come tumbling down in 1909. Jim took on a contract that was one of his most lucrative yet. Jesse West, Joe Allen, and Barry B. Burrell hired Jim to kill their enemy, Allen Augustus Gus Bobbitt of Ada, Oklahoma, who was a cattle rancher and former deputy U.S. Marshal. The men's issue with Bobbitt stemmed from their own unsavory and criminal activities as they frequently scammed Native American men in the area out of their land for incredibly low sums. West and Allen were known to get indigenous men drunk and convince them to sell the 160 acres of land they had been granted in exchange for their reservation land in Oklahoma, sometimes for only $50. Bob had heard of these schemes and began to speak publicly against them, some sources say that the men also wanted to acquire Bobbitt's land and thought killing him was the best way to go about it. Jim, who appeared to have no qualms about who he killed or why, took the contract eagerly. On February 27th, Jim set up an ambush where he hid himself behind a large oak tree near Bobbitt's ranch. When Bobbitt rode by the tree as he returned from town, Jim shot him in the side with his shotgun. Rather than wait to be caught, Jim fled the scene without checking to see if Bobbitt was dead. Though mortally injured, Bobbitt lived for an hour after he was shot. His wife had run out to check on him as soon as she heard the gunshot, and Bobbitt identified his killer to her, as well as told her to give a $1,000 reward for the capture of the man who shot him. As Jim escaped, he was so confident that he would get away with killing Bobbitt that he even told people what he had done. By April, Jim was once again arrested in Texas and then extradited to Oklahoma for a trial for Bobbitt's assassination. Alongside him were the men who had hired him, Jesse West, Joe Allen, and Barry B. Burrell. Though people were sure that these were the men responsible for Bobbitt's death, there was still slim evidence. And, as Jim could attest to, the legal system often let the guilty go free. But many of those who had known Bobbitt didn't want to risk the chance that the men who killed him would get off free. They decided to take justice into their own hands. On April 19, 1909, a mob of between 20 and 30 men gathered in the early hours of the morning outside the jail where Jim and the others were being kept. The mob overpowered the jailers and dragged the men out to an abandoned livery stable behind the jail. The men were said to have been bound with bailing wire and ropes were thrown over the rafters. There, the story goes that Jim Miller remained stoic as he was faced with the angry mob, while the other three men reportedly begged for their lives to be spared. There is much rumor and speculation about what actually happened during this confrontation. But it is known that West, Allen, and Burrell were all hanged first. Apparently, just before Jim was hanged, he was said to have made three requests. First, that his diamond ring be given to his wife. Second, that he could wear his black hat when he died. And third, that he be allowed to put on his customary black frock coat. The first two requests were allowed, while he was denied his black coat. It has been rumored that one of the men in the mob asked him to admit to his crimes, where Jim allegedly responded that he had killed 51 men. It is also rumored that Jim snapped at the mob, saying, If you're going to hang me, do it quick. 
Also, part of the myth around Jim Miller's death is that it was reported that before he was to be hanged, Jim shouted, let her rip, and then stepped voluntarily off the box where he stood. It appeared that Jim Miller, the killer, finally suffered the consequences of his crimes. The four men were left to hang for several hours until a photographer could come and document the event. In the photo, Jim can be seen hanging on the far left with his black hat still on. After his death, the image was sold to tourists who visited Ada for years. He eventually became known as Killin' Jim and Killer Miller. To this day, Jim Miller's kill count is contested, though he has reportedly been confirmed to have killed at least 12 people during gunfights. So, tell us what you think of this American outlaw and Old West professional killer. Do you believe Jim Miller's kill count was as high as 51 people? Let us know your thoughts in the comments.